All right. Good evening, and thank you for attending tonight's presentation. My name is Mike Noreen, and I am representing two of the organizations tonight that are sponsoring this, River Falls Municipal Utilities and Hope for Creation. A couple of the other sponsoring organizations are the University of Wisconsin River Falls Office of Sustainability, the United Church of Christ, and our host, the River Falls Public Library. Um, we're grateful to have these sponsors work together to bring events like this and to make it a reality. And if anyone wants more information on, on these events or how to get involved, we'll have the email address um, typed up on presentation later in, later in the show. But for right now, that is sustainability at uwriverfalls.edu. At UW and additionally, um, Hope for Creation, UCC, uh, City River Falls, we all have websites and Facebook pages, so you can just Google us and you'll find us. Uh, additionally, Hope for Creation is sponsoring a book read, and that book read is The Story of More by Hope Jaron. And this is, if you want more information on that, that too will be available at the table up uh, uh, at the top of the library, and also we'll have the uh, website typed up at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Reverend Dave Ostendorf and from the United Church of Christ, and he'll take it from there. Thanks, Mike. Let me uh, join in uh, welcoming all of you uh, who are gathered here and who are gathered online with us from across the country. We're really glad to welcome Dr. Mark Seeley back to River Falls. He's been here several times, and uh, he was here in 2014 uh, in the fall as one of our first climate speakers in the community and he really helped spread the early seeds what for what has become uh hope for creation which is a partnership of faith communities as mike mentioned the university the city the library and others uh committed to working together to build sustainability and conservation throughout river falls and beyond most of us know dr seeley for his long career as he helped all of us understand the critical relationship between weather and climate change. He uh, retired, allegedly retired, in 2018. <laughs> he did after 40 years as extension meteorologist and climatologist at the University of Minnesota. And his climate con conversations in Minnesota Public Radio have been going on, most of us know, since 1992, amazingly. And he still provides us such powerful and and, and strong insights into the realities of climate change in, in our area. His broadcast last Friday, in fact, <clears throat> focused on the wide range of January temperature changes as, that we experienced this past month. And as always, it was a very uh, powerful and, and informative uh, conversation he had. Dr. Seeley has participated in thousands of public speaking engagements and meetings and media interviews. He's taught people all over the U.S. and he has worked across the country and in Europe. It's published extensively and we, we all are so grateful for his, his being with us tonight. So please welcome him here and he's joining us online as I said earlier uh, with folks uh, we know across the country who are tuning in as well and who will tune in afterwards. Uh, the uh, evening will be available on the River Falls Public Library uh, website, YouTube and, and Facebook. Uh, Library has been such a valuable partner for all of us uh, these past several years, especially during the, the virus. So without further comment, let me welcome and let us all welcome together Dr. Seeley. That's water. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, yeah, it has been a while, Dave. Thanks for that kind introduction. Um, I uh, wanted to start off by uh, acknowledging a handicap I have here. Uh, I took my mask off. So you'll be able to read my face. You'll be able to read my nonverbals. But looking out of all of you, and unless you're really tricky with your eyebrows, I'm not going to be able to read your nonverbals. So 
I won't be able to really read whether uh, any of this is getting through or if it's provoking you to say something or whatever. So uh, anyway, hopefully we'll have time at the end uh, to uh, address some questions and things like that. So uh, I, uh, I framed this uh, a little bit different, but, uh, but for, oh, probably the last, at least the last 15, if not the last 20 years, when I've had to address the topic of climate change, uh, I framed it, and this is my community bias, if you will, I framed it as climate change in our own backyards. Because what's important uh, for most of us, because we care about each other and we care about the communities we live in, or at least most of us do, is uh, to understand this science in our own community context. I think that's a real important piece of this. So that's kind of what I've been concentrating on uh, in, in the second half of my career, if you will. Um, I also applaud, before I go any further, because I don't want to neglect this, Dave, I applaud all of the work I read about with respect to this community. This, this community's pushing the agenda and moving forward. And you should be proud of that. I've been to all 87 counties in Minnesota talking about this issue, and I think I've been to 14 or 15 Wisconsin counties, mostly in Western Wisconsin, to talk about this issue. And uh, in the context of all of that, to read about what you all have been doing in recent years and the conversations and the actions and the strategizing that your community has been doing is very laudable. Uh, so I want to compliment you on that. Um, we live in the central part of the North American continent. And what that means climatically is uh, we have a huge degree of variability. We have a huge degree of variability. As Dave alluded to with the month of uh, January that concludes today. Now, I don't know about Wisconsin, but in Minnesota in the month that ends today, we had 48 degrees back in the mid part of the month, you know, almost shirt sleeve weather for some of the U of M students. Uh, they're a little hardier than some of us, but, uh, and we had minus 44, okay? Minus 40, now we're not on the same day, but I mean, the juxtaposition of that spread is, was pretty close, 48 minus 44. That's pretty typical of the middle part of the North American continent. And uh, the reason I point that out to you is uh, as a climate scientist, you have to cope with that high degree of variability. And because that high degree of variability is always present, especially so in the winter, the winter season has the highest daily standard deviations. When you say, for example, that the normal high in River Falls on January 31, today's date, is uh, say 19 degrees, do you realize that's plus or minus a standard deviation of 15 degrees? I mean, what good is a normal to you when your standard deviation is almost the same size as your normal? So, uh, but the reason I bring that up is uh, as I talk about the evidence for climate change in our region, it has been a challenge to decipher signal from noise because the background data are so noisy statistically. Illustrated by today's date in Wisconsin. So in 1989, 63 degrees over at Kenosha. This is the same day length on January 31st. It's the same day length. It's the same sun angle. Okay, we're at the same spot in the North, North American continent. 63 in 1989, minus 50 in 1996 on January 31st. 18.8 uh, inches of snow over at Sheboygan in 1947. And even here in River Falls, minus 36 with a minus 47 wind chill 
on today's date just three years ago. Maybe some of you vividly remember that. I don't know. Maybe you were playing it smart and just staying inside on that day. But uh, so that's an example of the degree of variability that uh, check the daily stats and extreme range for a place like San Diego. It'll startle you. It really will compared to what we have here. Uh, I'm going to make comments about these subtopics, so I wanted you uh, to be alerted to what I would talk about. This isn't necessarily a chronology of what I'm going to talk about in order of appearance, if you will, but it's, uh, it has to do with the major themes of the content. So we have ample evidence in our gathered data. I'm not going to talk about what, well, I, except for one slide, I'm not going to talk about what climate models show. I'm going to talk about what real data show for our region. Uh, and there are disparities. We need to acknowledge there are disparities. Some areas, and this applies for our states, both Minnesota and Wisconsin, some landscape areas of each state are changing faster than other landscape areas of our respective states. There's disparity even within our own states. And we all know that there's disparity as we look in broader geographic areas as well. Uh, consequences and impacts. Uh, that That's, uh, I'm sure all of you have stories. I'm sure there's dozens and dozens of stories in this room about consequences and impacts that you personally attest to. Now, faith and stewardship always throws audiences a little bit. But I'll freely admit I'm a person of faith. I don't know how many of you would state that. Maybe the majority, maybe not. But a faith perspective on this issue is equally important, especially in the context of a stewardship ethic. Um, if you value your community and you do things for your community, uh, that's an important uh, value. Maybe it's a, I hope, I hope it's a shared value in this room, but that's the reason I include that. And then adaptability and sustainability, of course, two key words we've been throwing around now for about better part of two decades, which is real, a uh, real important when we uh, think about our own communities. Uh, and then a little bit about motivations and communications. And finally, a little bit about resources that we, uh, I, you may uh, bear in mind, I've been retired four years now. So uh, these resources I'm going to show you might be, I don't know how out, out of date. I keep thinking to myself or trying to convince myself that they're still relevant and pretty current. But uh, there are probably some, maybe some of you have become aware of in the last year or two that, that are even better from the standpoint of staying informed and knowledgeable about what's going on. Uh, here is the one piece of evidence from our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in terms of stepping through time, 30-year uh, periods, those are the standard National Weather Service normals periods, stepping through time and looking at the signature change in mean annual temperature as it's moved across uh, time. Uh, early part of the 20th century, and then stepping up to uh, 1991 to 2020. And of course, color-coded with the orange and red coloration signifying the amplitude of the warmth, the ap amplitude in the signal change in the mean annual temperature. And you can see that um, for us uh, here in, in uh, the Western Great Lakes region, Wisconsin and Minnesota, that uh, Yes, indeed, the color is pretty deep there. It's pretty dark. The changes have been pretty profound, uh, and uh, as they have in, in other parts of the country as well. Uh, here's a little closer look at the 48 contiguous states, and you can see the dark coloration there in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota and what the net change has been. Now, one feature of this slide that I like to point out that we must at least be a little bit sensitive to is, you know, our elected representatives in our federal government, whoever they are, 
often speak for their constituencies. Sometimes they don't. I mean, there's arguments for both, but look what's happened in the Southeast. The Southeast, as compared to the rest of the country, you see, they're not witness to, their data do not show the magnitude of change in the attribute of temperature that much of the rest of the country has experienced. So if I were given this talk about climate change in our own backyards in uh, Alabama or Mississippi or someplace down there, I'd be showing you vastly different data. In fact, I might even be showing you some data with respect to temperature that goes negative or shows a cooling trend, if you know what I mean. So we do have some disparity even in our own country when we look at the data, at what the, the message that the data are telling us. But here's the composite data for the state of Wisconsin, all observations, and you're blessed in Wisconsin, if you don't know this, to have about 152 long-term climate histories in the state of Wisconsin. That's pretty darn good for the size of your state. And so this is a composite look, and you can see the mean annual temperature uh, trend line, which is the blue line through the data, and then all the individual years marked. But what's striking, of course, about this, this piece of information is this post-1995 era. I guess what most of us looking at the age distribution in this room, what most of us have been living through here in recent years. Here's the grand mean, the horizontal the black line. Here's the grand mean of all of the data that spans, uh, what, 127 years or so. And then, but look, almost, there's very few exceptions down here, just a handful of years that have deviated below the grand long-term average. I mean, we've been populated with year after year after year that's warmer than normal for the state of Wisconsin. Now, this is true. This isn't an isolated snapshot of just Wisconsin. This trend is evident in uh, Minnesota. It's evident in the Dakotas. It's evident in Manitoba. It's evident in Ontario. It, there's a large central portion of North American geography where this kind of a trend is very evident. And then there's a list. It might be hard for you to read. If you can read the years, which is column number two, if you can read the years there over here, that's probably what's more important because what I want to do is make the point here this goes back to 1895, and these are the uh, warmest years in Wisconsin history, back to 1895. And I would venture that if you uh, frame that list of years in the context of your own life, that you individually have lived through many, many of the warmest years in Wisconsin's history. No ifs, ands, or buts uh, about that. And uh, so that's 2012 is right at the top of the list. Some of you may vividly remember 2012. Uh, not only I might add for warmth, but you probably vividly remember 2012 uh, for uh, how dry it was too. Uh, here's a little bit tighter geography. If you look at the map here of uh, Wisconsin, uh, Climate Division 4, which is West Central Wisconsin. So what I did was I discarded all of the other Wisconsin data outside Climate Division 4, just to show you what the trend looks like in a little narrower geographic context. But it's still there, and it's still quite emphatic. In other words, the message is still there. It doesn't change the essential message but that's if we narrow it down to a little tighter geography in, in uh, Western Wisconsin. And then season by season. Well, if we dissect the seasons, again, the blue line of seasonal average temperature is upward in all four seasons of the year. And uh, you may have heard me talk about this on the radio or television uh, in the latter part of my career, because it's equally true for Wisconsin and Minnesota that the slope of this blue line, the upward trajectory of mean seasonal temperature is steeper in the winter season than it is the other seasons of the year. 
things are changing more dramatically in the season of short days and long nights. Now that's kind of important to remember in that a season that is composed of short days and long nights from a temperature attribute standpoint tends to be dominated then much more so by the composition of the atmosphere. By the comp what is that atmosphere made up of? What's the gas constituents in there? How much water vapors in there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very much more amplified in winter than it is the other seasons of the year. Also, another disparity that really stands out in the uh, NOAA data is that uh, we in the Western Great Lakes region, uh, here you see the map showing that we're seeing a far greater amplitude of change in our nighttime minimum temperatures than our daytime maximum temperatures. And once again, I would make the argument that our nighttime minimum temperatures are far more regulated by atmospheric composition than our daytime temperatures when that sun heats the Earth's landscape and all the air mixes to a much greater degree than it does at night. So we're seeing that in evidence, in strong evidence in our particular region of the country. As a result, this is a comparison of 30 year normals for River Falls, taking 1971 to 2000, that 30 year period, and subtracting it from the more recently calculated 30 year normals of 1991 to 2020. And most of the months are positive. It was a positive change in the temperature values of most, most months. Uh, some of the months were more positive than others. January, almost three and a half degrees. December, even a little more than three and a half degrees. November, 1.7. September, 2.2. June, the season of longest days and shortest nights. Minus 0 0.1 degree. Uh, essentially, no change over that period, 1971 to uh, to present. Uh, Eau Claire, change in minimum temperatures at Eau Claire in a broader time frame, 1951 to 1980 versus say 1991 to 2020. Positive almost uh, six degrees in the average January minimum, uh, about nine degrees in the average February minimum, and uh, or not nine degrees, uh, five, um, well, four and a half degrees. And then March, uh, about four, close to four degrees. So really seeing a March upward in these, what we call average minimum temperatures. So net results, sometimes we need to stop for a minute and not look at data, but think about what are the impacts or consequences associated with these changes in the measured environment. So with respect to temperature, we see changes in depth and duration that our soils and lakes freeze. Again, we have tremendous variability year by year, but if we step through this decade by decade, we see that that is shrinking. The depth of average annual frost depth or the depth of ice on some inland lakes or any number of other things. Uh, so there's some other, there's a whole list here. I don't wanna go through all of them. One biological consequence, of course, is that certain microorganisms in the soil or certain uh, pathogens or certain insect species no longer suffer the high mortality that they once did from the more severe winters we used to see in the region. Um, we also see uh, changes in plant hardiness zones. So I'm sure your, your uh, Wisconsin Landscape Association, Landscape and Architecture Association is probably happy because that expands the number of plant species you can use to uh, landscape an area. It gives you a wider selection, for example. Uh, there's uh, increased, now this is one that both the Wisconsin Department of Transportation and the Minnesota Department of Transportation are a bit concerned about, and that is the increased frequency of freeze-thaw cycles. So we flirt more commonly with the 32-degree mark above, below, above, below. 
uh, in the olden days, and I remember uh, in the 70s and early 80s particularly, and this applies to River Falls equally, we would drop below 32 degrees in, say, the early December, and we might not see 32 degrees again till February. You know, all our high, high lows might fluctuate be, below the freezing mark. But those days are long gone by. Those days are long gone by. We, uh, we see a, far more fluctuation around the freezing mark. We all know about changes in bird uh, migration patterns, uh, hibernation, foraging behaviors. And then for public health considerations, uh, the Mayo Clinic actually has a lot of material out about this. The change in the mold and allergen season, it's longer. In fact, in our lifetime, it's not out of the question that the mold and allergy season extends into the month of December, whereas it used to have a pretty uh, strict cutoff time sometime in the autumn season. Similarly, we take the attribute of precipitation, annual precipitation, just as the earlier graphic showed you, we step through time and look at the changes across the country. In this case, the tans and browns, drier and drier signal in place, and the uh, light and dark green is a uh, wetter and wetter signal in place. And once again, for our Western Great Lakes geography over here, we're pretty loaded up with increases, increases in precipitation across time. Uh, and there's a closer look with the 48 contiguous states. Interesting that there's a little bit of disparity uh, west to east across Wisconsin. Uh, your, your amplitude of uh, wetness, your increase decade by decade is a little more pronounced in western Wisconsin than it is in eastern Wisconsin. But there's the upward trend about three and a half inches more annual precipitation taken as a whole across Wisconsin than there used to be 100 years or so ago. Uh, and again, a population from the standpoint of what we've experienced in our lifetimes, a population of extraordinarily wet years uh, in the last couple of decades. And in fact, the wettest year in Wisconsin state history only back in uh, 2019. How many have you bought more umbrellas? <laughs> Here again is the list of the wettest years. Uh, and again, if you look at the uh, column two on that, you'll see how many of them have occurred in your lifetime and what the numbers are. That's statewide, so that's a pooled data set. We average for to depict the entire state of Wisconsin. I think we average about 227 individual climate stations, which is Fairly, fairly large population. There's the Western Wisconsin uh, depiction for District 4 in Western Wisconsin. It's upward by the same degree of magnitude that the statewide signal is. And uh, again, shows the uh, same, what we call skew, skewed distribution with respect to our lifetime being um, that most of the years have seen more than average precipitation. And then the seasonal depiction, similarly, all four seasons, the blue line is the trend line through the data, and all four seasons of the year are upward in terms of total quantity of precipitation. Net changes, uh, Baldwin is up since 1951, 1980 by about uh, 9%. Um, River Falls, uh, up by about 17%, with some fluctuation in the, in the middle part of the period. Not much change in the 1951 through 1990 interval in terms of what we call average for river falls, but it certainly has been going up since. And Menominee uh, up by 16% um, over, the, over the same period. Now, I wanted to make a comment about this because this is where it gets a little tricky, but I think I want to take a minute so you'll make sure you absorb the message. And I think we've talked about this in other media, but not only are the Western Great Lakes 
re, uh, people in the Western Great Lakes regions seeing winter year by year, a quantity shift upward year by year. The intensity of the rainfall is changing. And this is an important because a lot of us are from a vulnerability standpoint in terms of our structures, our infrastructure, our storm sewer runoff systems, or just our streets and culverts, or the design of our buildings, or uh, you know what we wear, or how often we spend time outside. A lot of things are dictated and impacted by the intensity of rainfall. And that's changing. We're getting more frequent heavy doses. And there's ample, ample research to show this. And um, part of the driver, if that's the right word, part of the driver of that can be found in the data themselves. And I wanted to illustrate that with the radius on data from the Twin Cities, which goes back to uh, World War II. Every 12 hours, many of you may know this, every 12 hours uh, in our region, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. are the intervals, the Weather Service forecast offices release an instrumented balloon. And it carries an instrumentation package to the top of the troposphere and measures the vertical profile of temperature, pressure, moisture, and then, of course, you get the wind, the wind fields as, as it dissects the atmosphere. In terms of the moisture attribute, what that radius sonde is doing is it's integrating and telling you how much water vapor is contained in that, oh, 100,000 feet of atmosphere over you. How much water vapor is present there? The reason they like to measure that is that's fuel for any weather disturbances aloft that might produce precipitation. And so it sort of gives you a maximum or a ceiling uh, of what level of precipitation might possibly occur if the right dynamics took place. We call that variable precipitable water. Precipitable water. You don't say that real fast. So it's an integration of the water vapor content from the surface all the way up through the vertical atmosphere. The red line across this, these data and the scattered uh, uh, plot around it is a depiction of the maximum values uh, day by day, month by month. What's been striking is researchers at the Severe Storms Prediction Center in Oklahoma have found that for our region of the country, over Wisconsin and Minnesota, almost all of the maximum values of precipitable water over our geography have been measured since 1991. There's the fuel increase I was talking about. So the atmosphere is set up to deliver more precipitation when the atmospheric dynamics are such that it can precipitate. And so that's partly what's going on and driving this change in the frequency of these intense rainfalls. And indeed, most graphics and research across the region show that in terms of the incre increased frequency. And we see that in the individualized data sets. We see that once upon a time, the uh, two inch daily rainfall in our area or our neck of the woods was about a once per year recurrence interval. In other words, statistically, you could expect about one two inch rain per year. But since 1991, for all these communities, we've had a change in that frequency. Some of them are more approaching twice that than what they had previously experienced. And in fact, because of that, uh, your Wisconsin state climatologist at UW-Madison and our Minnesota state climatologist at uh, University of Minnesota St. Paul campus and several of the others in the region lobbied the National Weather Service to do a recalculation of the recurrence intervals for given levels of precipitation. Uh, simply stated, they wanted, because the nature of the change was, was, was so statistically significant, 
the four inch rain increasing in frequency, the six inch rain, the two inch rain, et cetera, that we needed to establish what are those frequencies now because the old manuals were from like 1960s. And sure enough, they changed and they produced a new document for the region called NOAA Atlas 14. And so all your highway engineers now that are redesigning and installing culverts for uh, runoff management, all your storm sewer runoff designers that are redesigning for new developments or even retrofitting uh, city developments to discharge at a higher volume of rainfall, they are all using the NOAA Atlas 14 now. And so all of these things have changed. The scary part for us in the scientific community is that the pace of change on the four inch rain or the six inch rain or the eight inch rain or what have you is such a dramatic pace of change that we're gonna need to redo the NOAA Atlas 14 about every 10 or 15 years. If you know what I mean, because we have a changing target. If you're gonna use target, if you use data as a target for your design criteria to manage water, you don't want the target changing so rapidly that it changes five times in your, in your uh, lifespan. So there's a big debate about this right now, about what are we gonna, what are we gonna do about this? Uh, and in fact, research from the Severe Storms Lab down in Oklahoma again, uh, Harold Brooks, who's been up to our region, both at the UW-Madison campus and the U of M campus in the Twin Cities many times to lecture, uh, he has built his research reputation around the northern migration of severe thunderstorm days. And in our lifetime, we're seeing a higher, what I mean by a northern migration is we're seeing a frequency of severe thunderstorms migrate to higher and higher latitude. So that uh, what Dr. Brooks will tell us is in the Wisconsin, especially western Wisconsin, where River Falls is, and out across central Minnesota, we now have summer by summer about the same number of severe thunderstorm days that Oklahoma had about 30 or 40 years ago. So that's what's going on uh, with the dynamic change. So all of these wetness, uh, quantity change in precipitation, frequency change in intense rainfalls, et cetera, are driving us to consider changes in our runoff and sediment and shoreline management, uh, our storm sewer runoff, system designs, a fisheries, protection for soil erosion, buffer strips, I don't know, we got now uh, in Minnesota agriculture at least, but buffer strips along field borders and things like that, especially sloped field borders are becoming uh, mandatory. Uh, uh, lots of mitigation work by the Associ Association of Floodplain Managers. I don't know how active your group in Wisconsin is, but I, I would guess it's been pretty active in the last decade. And uh, redesign and relocation of water treatment plants. Whereas once, a, 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 you know, probably two, three generations ago, both in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and we're proud of these wonderful, magnificent inland waterways we've had, but for wastewater treatment plants, we had the notion that they ought to be located real close to those waterways. Well, our knowledge has increased enough that we know we better mitigate that. If we're gonna have a wastewater treatment plant within 100 feet of the Chippewa River or the St. Croix River or whatever, we better darn well guard against it getting flooded out by a six inch rain or something like that. So we've got those kinds of considerations uh, going now. Uh, heat, uh, I illustrate this and I think this applies at least this applies to Western Wisconsin. I don't know about the whole state, but year by year, we can step through time and look at various declared heat waves. Most of these are by declaration of the weather service. Uh, and um, the reason I highlight the red years is the red years, there was indeed a declared heat wave, but it wasn't because the thermometer was measuring 100 degrees or 105. It's because the dew point or water vapor content in the atmosphere was so high 
that it made the 88 or 90 degree air temperature outside feel like 105. And so you can see if you look at what we've been living through the last several decades is almost an entire range of heat wave encompassed by high water vapor content. Not because we were setting all kinds of temperature records, but just because it was such a high dew point. And um, we had this occur across the region back in July of 2011, 11 years ago. Oh, well, not even 11 years ago. And these are still records for these communities. Uh, dew points were as high as 80 to 88 degrees. Now, 80 to 88 degrees in Wisconsin and Minnesota is like taking the environment in Cancun, Mexico, and transporting it right up to where we live. It's that much of a geographic displacement. So you superimpose an 80 or 88 degree dew point with an 88 to 94 degree temperature, and you're off the charts on your heat index. And uh, so you can see New Richmond, 113, Menominee, 110, Sparta, 106, Eau Claire, 111. I mean, we normally don't expect this. You might as well go to the sauna at the gym if you want to feel like that. Uh, so we've got some dynamics and changes associated with this. Uh, in the healthcare industry, uh, there's lots of attention given to this because this can be very stressful for people who have chronic maladies that are already affecting their life, such as if they have multiple sclerosis or chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, or they have some other uh, ailment. Uh, they're hyper, hypersensitive to these kinds of things. Uh, livestock stress. We've lost, we've had episodes where we've lost livestock due to these uh, stressors. And more and more demands for environmental controls. Uh, and so, um, and of course, increased demand on our regional electrical grid. And, uh, and our, our co-ops and our power providers are always worried about negotiating contracts to back themselves up so that they get pushed into the corner on a July day where the peak demand just goes off the charts. They have some backup where they can come in with some supplemental power to make sure that we don't all uh, dry up or get uh, heat stroke or whatever. Um, now, there is a group in this country, it's become more and more visible over the last decade, called the National Adaptation Forum. It encompasses all 50 states. They meet not every year, they meet for a national conference every other year. And I might be wrong, my memory's a little fuzzy, but I think they had one of their sessions in Madison, but I don't remember what year it was. We had one in 2017 over in St. Paul, Minnesota, and we had 1,600 people from all 50 states attend. Now, what's nice about getting a group like this together for an adaptation forum is that you get representatives from all walks of life and all scales of communities, the smallest to the biggest, that are bringing to the table their experiences in climate adaptation practice. They're practitioners. And this is really a wonderful, wonderful way to exchange ideas on what worked and what didn't work and who you partnered with and things like that and what the impacts were. Um, the reason I'm showing this one was uh, this is a photo of, of a group we convened for the 2017 forum in St. Paul that was faith-based responses to climate change. We had four denominations represented, and it was the first time at the National Forum we were allowed to have a faith-based discussion of this, and it turned out to be one of the most popular sessions at the conference. And uh, I found it very eye-opening, all the common ground we found. All the common ground we found, regardless of what your religious background was, around the theme of stewardship. There's a mandate to be stewards. 
And I think most cultures, regardless of religion or religious affiliation, most, most cultures have a value or an ethic that says we take care of each other and we take care of our community because we share the resources of that community. The resources of that community are what give us our quality of life. And um, so anyway, we came to a, they, they drafted a statement. Uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but we stand up for children, grandchildren, and future generations in the context of the threats of climate change. And we want to uh, do our best to protect them. We stand up for the poor, uh, we stand up for creation itself, not just the human species, but we stand up for the world around us, uh, all the natural resources and all the living organisms that we share this planet with. Whoops. How do I get that back? I made it go. Oh, there we go. Uh, and so as a consequence of that, we call for action. And uh, as was pointed out in some of the literature I received from your community, the, the, uh, the Hope for Creation group, is it three, Dave, of your churches that have built, used solar, solar arrays? That's, that's wonderful. That's absolutely. So that some, in some communities, in some places, the people that comprise churches are leading they're stepping out and they're trying to lead by role modeling some of this. And I think that's great. I think we need more and more of that to go on. Um, future depictions of what our region might look like. Uh, those, these were released uh, earlier in the year 2021. Uh, depending on the current pace of change, whether it's maintained, whether it's mitigated and slowed down or whether God forbid it accelerates. Uh, we're in for yet more changes ahead of us. This isn't suddenly going to plateau. So from a science standpoint, the message here is, in our lifetime at least, we're probably not going to see this pace of climate change plateau. Even if we take the most aggressive mitigation strategies we can, it might be seen by our kids and certainly seen by our grandkids but in our own lifetimes, we still need to take it because that's the only way we're gonna, we're gonna get out of this. If we just let it run rampant, we're gonna have an uninhabitable planet. That's not gonna work. Um, so uh, from a sustainability and infrastructure standpoint, there's lots of things we can consider community by community. Uh, water supply, wastewater treatment, and hydropower, uh, all in the water sector of our community. Renewable energy, deployment of renewable energy, uh, whether it be local arrays, arrays that plug into the grid or uh, what have you. Uh, transportation, some communities are really stressing more uh, access to public transportation or some communities are really stressing more uh, pedestrian and uh, and uh, bicycle kinds of, uh, for, for those kind of people. Uh, waste management and how we handle uh, landfills, how we handle our waste management, including composting and things like that. More and more communities are getting on board with that sort of thing. Uh, food production and distribution of our infrastructure system. So more and more uh, emphasis on locally grown uh, food production, farmers markets and CSAs and a whole range of other things and then helping with the distribution. You know, one thing that I, uh, I sit on the board of, of a, a food hub in the Twin Cities. And one thing I was uh, inspired to see, if you can be inspired at age 75, I think you still can, uh, is that um, the pandemic has really brought out a wonderful attribute in our area of caring for the people that are hungry and finding ways to get food on the table. And I know probably more, if I, if I canvass my own personal life and my connections with neighbors, friends, colleagues, et cetera, there's probably a higher fraction of people out there volunteering in the food sector 
because of the pandemic than I ever would have visioned. Whether it's food preparation or whether it's uh, training, culinary training or delivering food or whatever. It's just a phenomenal number of people that have been helping with this kind of thing. Uh, public health sector is another one. And then uh, overall education. Uh, I told uh, Dave the story, one, one of the facets of my career that I was very happy to participate in was uh, uh, for about 19 or 20 years, I taught atmospheric science and climate science to school science teachers. So the course was just for school science teachers. And Jerry Larson from uh, your community uh, uh, here and I uh, did this. And we, I think we reached 107 different school districts. And it was great to see that curriculum about the scientific evidence for climate and climate change going into those school district curriculums and getting young children on board with what was really happening in the world so that they wouldn't allow adults around them to be so dismissive about it because they had seen the science of it in the classroom. Uh, and then, of course, preservation and conservation of our natural resources, something that actually Wisconsin, God bless Wisconsin. I mean, Wisconsin's had a long history of this, for crying out loud, among all the states. And, uh, and that's water, forests, wetlands, soils, ecosystems, et cetera. Now, there are some obstacles. My goodness. And, you know, I have to confess to you, uh, growing up in the 50s and 60s and doing all this other stuff, I wasn't exposed to how to communicate. I think in higher ed, we spend a lot of time now with our students on, you know, how to communicate. But nobody taught me how to communicate. Uh, what little I know about communicating is experiential knowledge. You know, I tried this. I didn't work. I tried this. Oh, it worked or whatever. It's it's experiential. So I'm get, I'm coming at you totally from experiential. This is not from any textbook or anything. OK. Obstacles. We've got disparity, human being to human being. OK. In what we know. OK. Cognition side of things, what we know or understand in our emotions about things, how we feel. How do we feel about that river? How do we feel about uh, fresh water? How do we feel about our grandkids? How do we feel about the cars on our roads? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can pick almost any kind of theme. But we have certain different emotional ties to that. Ethics, uh, another a whole other one. What's important to us? Uh, more often than not, for our generation, it's everything is important to us, but we we have to prioritize. So I don't know about you, but uh, most days I probably think about two or three things that are important to me. I don't think about 15 or 20. Uh, and then politics. Unfortunately, the divisiveness of our politics is so extreme. But uh, you can have people that don't want to. I mean, you could even bring up a one word topic for crying out. You could bring up a one word topic and you could almost create a, a, a division in the room from a one word topic. Uh, so we've got those obstacles to overcome and uh, we need to understand each other's motivation. What motivates us? What motivates us to get involved? What motivates us to even talk about certain issues? And what motivates us to take action? And it's all over the place. It's really all over the place. Uh, and so what resonates with one person may not resonate with another person, uh, et cetera. Now, personal. And I don't mind at my age getting personal. If I was 35, I probably wouldn't be talking about this stuff. But sometimes you have to tell the stories about what motivates you. And then people might understand where you're coming from a little bit better. So this is my great-great-grandfather, Ira Seeley. He came to Minnesota in 1854 from Wisconsin. Yeah, he was a resident of Durand, Wisconsin in the 1840s and early 1850s. And then he came across the Mississippi River and he settled in, in the Wabashaw County. 
he lived in a cave with his livestock the first two years, but I don't like to talk about that. Then, then he, finally built, he finally built a log cabin on the Zumbro River. And he got elected to be a territorial legislator uh, representing southeastern Minnesota. And then later, when statehood came in 1858, he served in the legislature from 1858 to 1862. Now, this was the Minnesota Territory trying to become a state. And if you don't think the citizens had issues to debate in those days, you're dead wrong. And I got hold of some of Ira's papers and saw what he had to cope with, you know, the, some of the issues he had to deal with back in the day. And, uh, and they, they were tough. They were tough issues. And I thought, well, God, if this guy can do it, but way back when we became a state, maybe I need to stick with this issue of climate change and keep trying to pound in some of the knowledge and, and then sharing some of the experiences and stuff like that. The other person I greatly admired, mostly through my daughter, was Maya Angelou. And one of her quotes was, words mean more than what is set down on paper. It takes the human voice to infuse them with deeper meaning. In other words, the dialogue between us is important. What we say to each other and what we share with each other is important. And I've been sharing every Friday morning on Minnesota Public Radio for 30 years. I'm the longest serving commentator on NPR's Morning Edition program. Believe it or not, which some say exemplifies huge tolerance on the part of the management of the Minnesota Public Radio. But uh, nevertheless, that's that's the way it is. And then I was one of the founders of this group late in my faculty career, uh, the Minnesota Climate Adaptation Partnership, which is uh, a group of individuals from all over the state that inform and advocate for climate adaptation practices in all sectors of our economy, affecting all portions of our infrastructure and in all aspects of the environment of our natural resources. And we come together to share information. It's not purely an academic conference. A lot of it is experiential knowledge and pragmatic issues, whether you're from a water a district in the state or you're from a public works department or a road engineering, or you're from an architecture firm, or a healthcare firm, or whatever. We're sharing ideas and experiences. And some of the th uh, things that we've come up with are illustrated here, and I think they dovetail main mainly with what I know about the direction that your community is moving. Some of the direction your community in River Falls is moving. And um, you're carrying that burden on your back, and hopefully, as you keep pushing forward, you'll find more and more people to partner up with or walk that path with you here in River Falls so that it becomes a truly a community-wide effort and everybody buys into it. Uh, and then from a resource standpoint, there's all kinds of great things out there. Some of you are probably familiar with most of these. Our good friend, Kerry Emanuel at MIT, I think is out with his third edition of what we know about climate change. It's about 126 page read. It's a short read. Uh, let's see, uh, Catherine Hayhoe is on here. She's out with a new book and I don't have it listed. If you just Google her name, it will probably list her most current book. Um, and um, she's done, a, excuse me, she's now uh, the uh, science the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. She, I think she's still on the faculty at Texas Tech University, but I think she, now she's also the chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy. And uh, all of these different uh, podcasts and, uh, and other things that you can tie into. And uh, locally here in River Falls, you can uh, tune in to NPR over in uh, downtown St. Paul, and you can hear Paul Hutner's climate cast every Thursday afternoon if you want to keep up on current research and issues with respect to our region. He tries to focus more on our region than other regions in the country, which I applaud him for. Uh, and then uh, 
my, I always use this last. This is my grandkids' favorite slide because they know their grandpa is a member of the Cloud Appreciation Society. And uh, so for those who doubt or wish to dismiss the evidence that climate is changing, the data from our backyards indicate it is happening and already producing consequences. It is clearly poor judgment to ignore this. Make sure your government leadership knows this. We're almost getting to the point. We're almost getting to the point where what are, regardless of what local unit of government you're dealing with, it's a city, it's a county, it's the state legislature, it's the feder, it's the feds, whatever. If you don't have on board representing you as a community, a person who thinks that climate change is a major issue of this millennium, you need to say goodbye to that person. I mean, we're almost getting to that point. You need to say goodbye to that person because we're going to have to start accelerating our efforts and we're going to have to start pulling each other along if we're going to get some things done in a time frame that means something, that means something for our children and our grandchildren. We are right on the threshold of that, and that and that is a solid argument. That is a sol all the scientific evidence make that a very solid argument. So we're almost at that point, and uh, I I hate to say that, but that's just the way it is. And so um, being advocates, continuing dialogue, doing what you can, putting your community first and moving forward is an is is almost an absolute must from my standpoint so we have the tension of course we're america aren't we we have the tent we have the tension between individual freedom and capitalism individual freedom and community needs i mean we've seen that play out all over the place look at the masks look at the mask issue for crying out loud okay look at the vaccination issue Look at the climate change issue. We've got those tensions here playing out all over the place. But putting the value on community, I think there's arguments, whether you wanna make a religious argument or not, there's arguments all over the place for that. Because I, my personal feeling, being a person of faith, is we're genetically designed to live in community. So that's where I end up, and uh, I'm happy to uh, take any questions or comments. I thank you very much. You know, I wasn't reading very well at all your nonverbals, <laughs> but I at least did see that a lot of your eyes remain focused. So that, so I guess, so I guess that's a good sign, and uh, so I, I, I'm grateful. Uh, for the opportunity to talk to you about this. What you heard from tonight, by the way, is a uh, mixture of a scientist and a citizen perspective. And uh, I think that's uh, something we need. <clears throat> if we have had a career in science, we need to be a citizen too, and talk about it in the context of being a citizen as well as a scientist. So. Anybody? Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Yes. I have a comment. Um, I'm very grateful that you brought up hydropower. Well, I'll take this off. I'm very grateful you brought uh -huh. up hydropower because we have hydropower here in River Falls, and, and history has shown we can make two million kilowatt hours a year and yep. make revenues on it because they're community owned and we've been doing it for 120 years oh yeah yeah there's lots of communities going through that and trying to add to i mean uh in in other places trying to add to that with the deployment of lots of renewables we've got some new uh wind power uh networks going up we've got some new solar arrays going up and uh you know the variability 
uh, the variability in our water resource is just going to get greater and greater. The, the, uh, it, we're gonna, uh, what I mean by that is our wetter periods are going to get wetter than what we've observed historically. But it's equally likely that we will have drier periods that get drier. Okay? And, uh, and that's kind of scary. That, that's kind of scary. You know, there's, I, I, there's a lot of things that have happened in this world. In fact, even if we just take the last year, let's just look at last year real quickly. Okay, I've been a scientist for about 51 years, about 40, um, I've lost track, 45 or 46 here in Minnesota, before that with NASA at the Johnson Space Center, and before that at the University of Nebraska. Um, I never, from my experience, would have guessed that light in British Columbia would see a 100 degree, a 121 degree air temperature. I never would have guessed that in a million years. Lighten British Columbia, Canada, 120, not a heat index, 121 degrees on the thermometer. Set a new all time record, highest temperature ever measured on any piece of the Canadian landscape. And the very next week burned down, the entire town burned down by a wildfire. I would have never guessed from reports from the Chinese Meteorological Organization that central China would see a 30 inch rain in 24 hours. They would have probably the most amplified hurricane or tropical cyclone from the lower latitudes, like 15 or 20 degrees north latitude. They would see that level of rainfall over central China 30 inches in 24 hours. I would not have guessed that in a million years. So there are, I never would have guessed that Northern Siberia, 72 degrees north latitude, inside the Arctic Circle, would see a 100 degree air temperature reading. Not a, not a heat index, a 100 degree thermometer reading. I never would. So what's scaring me as a, basically a, a very senior citizen is that I'm seeing measurements, I'm seeing real data of phenomena atmospherically that is just off the charts from anything I've ever been trained to anticipate. And that's very frightening. It makes me wonder what's next. It really does. It makes me wonder what's next. Yes. In terms of data, are there places to go that you would suggest that are like a highly reputable place for data resources? Or what do you use to evaluate your sources for uh, My two fallbacks uh, in, in my career have been uh, um, either NOAA or NOAA affiliates, affiliates. Now here in Wisconsin, you have the Wisconsin State Climate Office at Madison, but more importantly, you have the Midwest Climate Center at Purdue University that keeps all of your daily and hourly measurements from Wisconsin in one central accessible database all the way back to, uh, I don't know how far back, 1870s in some cases. Is it a public database? Yeah, you can uh, Google Midwest Climate Center I think you can sign up for an account. Of course, you got to set up a username and password, and then you can interrogate all the data you want. There's giga, giga, gigabytes of data in there. Um, the Minnesota State Climate Office, uh, if you Google that too, they have some Wisconsin data, but it's mostly the western part of the state. They don't cover the whole state like the Midwest Climate Center does. Uh, so you can find those kind of th things there. Trying to think of where else. <clears throat> the Weather Underground. Uh, it, uh, have, have any of you ever used the Weather Underground? Yeah. Uh, the Weather Ungr Underground database is not bad for detail. You know, if you want to know 4 o'clock, uh, July 9th, uh, 1998, River Falls or Eau Claire or, I mean, you know. 
it's just only about the last three or four decades. So it, its reach back in time is not as deep as some of those NOAA resources. Um, trying to think if I've overlooked. Those are those are some of the main ones. Anyway, yeah. And you once you get in there, uh, we call this anybody that gets hooked on those. You know how kids get hooked on on uh, oh you know video box game, you know, all that stuff. I, I try to ignore that. Uh, but um, the risk with becoming a Midwest climate system user or a state climate database user is that you find yourself doing too much recreational climatology. Recreational climatology can become a habit. Oh, you know, well, great, great grandma got married on, uh, you know, uh, whatever, uh, uh, you know, June 1st, 1917 in Sheboygan. Gee, I wonder what her wedding day was like. Or, I mean, you can find stuff, you know, you can find stuff like that out. And I know a lot of people that are recreational climatologists, you know, that's, but anyway, it's, it, it, yeah, all those data, they, the Weather Service has done a remarkable job in our lifetime of trying to make every piece of data publicly accessible. And, you know, that's a story, that's another little sidebar, but it's important. You know how sometimes we look about, we look around the world around us and we find uh, that we're not sharing information too well, you know, like information is, is, is maybe free or accessible in one country, but not in another and blah, 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 and all that stuff. One thing in the discipline of meteorology and climatology that's really magnificent when you think about it is every piece of data from every country in the world is accessible through the World Meteorological Organization. There are no barriers. Even during war, even when we're at war with somebody, we can access their meteorological and climatological data. And I don't know, that must go back to some written agreement from centuries ago. But that's among all the scientific disciplines, some of the other scientific disciplines look at us and just shake our heads. What are you doing? But every piece of data is accessible through the World Meteorological Organization. Yes. Mark, thanks so much for your presentation. Are you? Is that Holly? It is. Oh my God! Hi, Holly. Hi. And to your, you know, your contributions, your advocacy, it's all been really incredible. You have some fantastic pictures of clouds up on the screen, and clouds are so important in regulating climate and yeah. feedbacks. Can you talk a little bit about climate change and changes in clouds that we've experienced, or cloud cover that we've experienced in this part of the Midwest? I can't, talk, uh, from the standpoint, first off, it's great to see you, Holly. Uh, secondly is, uh, I can't talk so much about cloud type because I haven't studied that as much as cloud height. Now that's been studied prolifically. And what I do know about changes in cloud height in our region is that as the region has warmed, and by the way, I'm not just talking about Wisconsin, Minnesota, I'm talking about Manitoba and Ontario and the, the whole area. The mixing depth of the atmosphere is driven by the temperature profile of the atmosphere. The warmer the atmosphere, volumetrically, the bigger the mixing depth. You have a bigger area for the heat and moisture to be transported, okay? As a consequence of those physics, what happens is decade by decade, as we get warmer in Wisconsin and Minnesota, we get a deeper and deeper mixing depth. And so cloud tops, the classic cumulonimbus that we have where we have a vertical dimension of cloud until it hits the top of the troposphere and then it breaks off into an anvil form or something like that, you know what I mean. Or some people call those turkey towers or and there's a wide range of things. That's getting greater and greater. So in our lifetime, we've seen maximum cloud tops and pilots that fly over our region have reported on this. We've seen maximum cloud tops go up between 64 and 68,000 feet. Something that previously you'd only see over like Oklahoma or Texas or someplace down there. 
And so uh, we do get, um, there's more convective energy. Okay. Some would argue that uh, we should be seeing a change in severe convective weather, but in Minnesota so far, although we did have those tornadoes last month for the first time in history, 20 tornadoes on December 15th. But the convective energy in the atmosphere overhead is becoming more amplified in all seasons of the year. Now, the only statistical evidence we have to show a trend there is that in both Wisconsin and Minnesota, we have a higher frequency of one inch diameter hail than we've ever had, which says that the vertical, the winds aloft, the, the updraft winds aloft are so strong they're keeping the suspended ice aloft long enough to aggregate to a one inch diameter stone before it falls to the ground. And so we're seeing more evidence of that. But as to the winds and the lightning strikes and the tornadoes and the blah, blah, all the straight line, we don't have enough statistical evidence yet to suggest that there's you know a correlation with those elements. I wish there was something I could say, Holly, about cloud types, because I love cloud types. I think living in the Midwest here, we're exposed to about every cloud type there is. And, and that's magnificent, because I consider the sky God's canvas. And the things you see in the sky are just phenomenal. And, uh, but I don't, I don't yet see any papers or any discussion of, you know, is this, is the variability or the frequency of certain cloud types changing. I don't see anybody doing that science. I don't know. Maybe it's going to come out sometime, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. Just another another question about the science and the data communication and and the common person can't digest the data. You look at those trends and yeah. you can still say, well, you know, your trend lines right through your data points. So, you know, really it's your within variation. One standard deviation is right. You know, right. Right. So at, at the risk of sounding like a villain or being the villain, I've worked my whole career in the plastics industry. Yeah. And I'm all for the compostable, reduce, reuse, recycle sort of thing. And I'll tell you something, in the last three years, five years, I've never seen the move away from plastics to compostables, to reusables, to getting rid of single use, getting back to the cyclic economy. And I would say we could probably trace it to that image on the internet of the sea turtle with the straw in its nose. Okay? Oh. All of that science, the billions of pounds and tons of plastic used every year, nothing has moved the world and mobilized it, particularly yeah. the young kids, like that picture of the sea turtle. Yeah. What is your equivalent of that picture of the sea turtle with it straw in its nose to get people motivated to do something about climate? Good question. Excellent question. I don't know. I think that's partly why your, your point's well taken, and I don't have an answer for it, but it partly provides some insight. <laughs> yeah, it's, it partly provides some insight into why we see the media latch on immediately to any stories about extreme events or episodes. And then they jump all over to find a scientist that wants to make a comment about attribution. You know what I mean? So that, well, this is directly attributable to... Uh, and uh, and uh, if you're trained scientifically, I don't know, it's, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's an, an analogy for this, and I can't think of one. If you're trained scientifically, you're loath to do that mm -hmm. because that's a presumption you were told not to make. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But now, but now, within the American Meteorological Society and within the Royal Meteorological Society in the UK and similarly in Australia, there's an entire division of scientists that are forensic in nature that attack those problems and try to come out with attribution. Probability of attribution is the proper term for almost every extreme that occurs. But it takes some time. You know, as soon as light in British Columbia burned down last summer, there were people all over that. And, uh, and, and everybody's going, give us some time here, please. You know, 
please give us some time. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. But yeah, things of a dramatic and traumatic nature that destroy or affect communities on a grand, grand scale, they're, yeah, they're, they're used in that way. They're, you, you know what I mean? Right. But I don't know how you can be in front of a group like this and consistently come up with something, a story or a, I mean, stories work. Sometimes I think they work, especially if they're community-based as strong motivators for getting people on board about certain things. I mean, let's face it. Anybody in this room lost a child or a relative to COVID? Not yet. Oh, you have in the back. Okay. I used to work with the weather service in the 90s and the early 2000s. We would do follow up with communities after a tornado or after a flood or something like that. And remember how I said at the outset that a lot of my knowledge of, that I was conveying here from a personal perspective was experiential knowledge. So dealing with those communities was traumatic because those people were personally impacted so that in the future, anything to do, whether it's a statistical probability or not, with a tornado or a flood, that is going to grab their attention 100%. But somebody that's never experienced that, you know, you're going to have to make a real hard case to get your your points of risk across. So that's just the nature of the human. That's that's the way we are, but that's a tough one to tough one to do. I'm very sorry for your loss. Yeah, my three grandkids got through that over the holidays. So uh, that's a tough one. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. I appreciated your uh, good attendance and all those good uh, eye contacts either on me or on the screen. I, appre I appreciate it a lot. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Steely. Uh, our next event will be uh, February 24th at 6 p.m. It'll be online uh, at the public at the public library, Facebook, YouTube. It'll be on responsible investments with regard to um, environmental uh, sustainability. So if you can join on that, that would be great. April 24th, we're going to have a major, major community gathering, Earth Fest 2022, over in uh, the park. Uh, all afternoon on Sunday, the 24th of April. We hope you'll join that. And finally, uh, if you're interested in joining in the great work of a dynamic uh, partnership, uh, Hope for Creation, the university, the city, and so on, uh, Martha and uh, Krista have been handing out information about that. Uh, please do that. Please join us. Uh, we need uh, uh, all, the, all the participation we can have. It is a group of incredibly dedicated and committed people that meet every month to sort out new pathways uh, for our community. So join us. Thank you all for coming. It's been a blessing to have you. Be well. Thank you.